Um, I don't want to bore you with numbers this morning, but we might have to look at them a little bit because uh, at the end of the day, if the economics don't work and if the money is not there, there is no more money for charity, for environmental programs, for poverty programs. So everything is interlinked to the economics. What is very important to look at is where does this economic sort of lie? As we know, the US is uh, huge, has a huge economy. It has about 26% of the GDP of the world. And it used to have 23%, and now it's about 26%. I'm not here to speak about the United States, but it's hard not to when it has such an important presence on the economic side. We look at uh, the US. Uh, we're going to look at it as their interconnectivity to the global world, because we're interested at the Global Creative Leadership Summit. We're really interested about global action. What are the actions today that will influence tomorrow for better or for worse? We need to know today, if we don't do certain things, how negative that kind of non-action or action will have on the rest of our programs. So we're going to start by looking at what is the role of the United States and the influence of the United States onto the different elements, financial elements, of, of the world. This is a very important chart, and it shows that what I just said, that uh, the United States has 26% of the GDP in 1990, and now actually it's 23%. So we're at 14.6 trillion. I tried to simplify as much as we can every single number that is put in the media. A lot of times you read too much debt, uh, too much, uh, too little revenues, unemployment, unemployment. I try to put it in a context as simple as I could, and it's still complicated. But what is very important on this slide is you see the, the growth from 1990 to 2010 of China. And you see the decline of Japan from 17% to 9%. So these are numbers to remember. And what is very important to look at is when you do the projections or the budgets for the next 10 years, if you see this kind of growth for China, what will be the influence of this number onto the United States? And that's the most, one of the most important questions to ask ourselves. The top five US trading partners in 2010. You can see here what is interesting is um, the total trade and the trade deficit. And the highest one is China. You got US exports, what is coming out of, uh, of, of the United States, 91 billion and 364 billion in US imports. You can see a trade deficit of 273 billion. And it's by large the largest difference. Oops. The financial crisis. I guess the United States was not alone. We all know that. But we, not, we don't know. I mean, the influence here that we're trying to show is the financial crisis market correlation. So these are the performance of the various countries. China went down 65.39% in 2008, United States 38%. So I think what I'm trying to prove is that we're all completely interconnected. The debt level and who's holding the treasuries of the United States you got China at 1.2 trillion, 
which is 26%, Japan at 20%, with 914 billion. Another way of looking at our interconnectivity. So, this is why I'm going to focus a little bit, a little bit on, on the United States, and the United States being a very important partner of the world. This U.S. tax revenue table is very important. We're looking at, uh, basically what I'm saying to myself, I, I'm not a politician and I'm not an economist. I'm an entrepreneur. I build businesses and turn businesses around and create products. I innovate and I create new products. Every two years I create something. And I'm looking at this as an entrepreneur and as a business person. And I think the first thing to look at is the income statement and the balance sheet. And if there was a company here, I'd be asking myself a few questions. One of them is, what was I making? My total revenue, what is my EBITDA equivalent, is $2 trillion. That's in 2000. In 2010, I'm only at $2.2 trillion. I'm sort of worried. I'm saying to myself, I'm just not growing. As a company, there's no growth in here. So as a country, if you do the parallel, you say to yourself, two trillion going to 2.2 trillion in 2010. But what worries me more is the budget. The budget for the CBO is at 4.7 trillion in 10 years. How can we assume that we're going to go from 2.2 trillion to 4.7 trillion. When I do a budget, I look at the best case scenario, the conservative scenario, and the worst case scenario. I certainly don't budget everything on the best case scenario. And that's what we're doing. That's what the C CBO is doing, and it's very risky. I'm projecting about a 3% growth in taxes, and then uh, in GDP, and the government is actually predicting 4.7% to get to their 4.7 trillion. So this is based on the, uh, the growth of the GDP. So the percentage difference between our 2020 estimate is still very high. We're saying that from 2010, the individual income, income tax is $899 billion. And we're saying that we're going to go to $1.8 trillion. Already, I'm very aggressive. What is very interesting to know is, is where, where does the government actually make money? They make it on individual income taxes. 53% of the income of the government is done on individual income tax. Very little on corporate income tax. And 29% on social insurance taxes. So these numbers are very important. So to drive, the question to ask ourselves is how do we drive this economy? As people are getting more unemployed, there's less less earnings in terms of individual income. Ah. Let me see. Here's the table on expenses. There's a lot of numbers, so I'll let you take the time to, to look at them. Here we have um, the 2,000 actuals. And you have, you can see that 23% of the expenses of the Congressional Budget Office is, um, is Social Security. And then this Medicare is 17.5%. What is enormous is the growth that you see, the percentage increase from the Medicare 216 billion in 2000 
going to 903 billion. It's enormous. Social Security, the expense would go 406 to 1.2. Then you have defense at $295 billion in 2000, going to $689 billion in 2010, that's the actual number, and $851 billion for 2020. These are enormous growths. So your total expenses in 2000 was $1.79 trillion. And in 2010, it's 516 trillion. But what is very interesting about this is that you have, if I go back to my revenue page, which was, the estimate is 4.7 4 in, in terms trillions in terms of your revenue, and that's very aggressive. And if you take 3.3, which is still high to conservative, you're at a deep loss. And this is your loss. So your treasury budget for 2020, for, us, for them, the CBO assumptions, is the revenue of 4.7 trillion, which is really very, very aggressive. It's very aggressive because when you look at the numbers, for the growth of the GDP of China, and India is not here, you see that the big question, is it sustainable, this 5% growth for the revenue? And my answer is no, it's impossible. Because we've never performed at those rates in the last 10, 15 years. In 2020, we, we predict 3.3, and still there, it's quite aggressive. And even with revenues going to 3.3 and their expenses at 5.2, you have a deficit of 1.8 trillion by 2020. So it's not sustainable. But it's not about the Democrats and it's not about the Republicans. It's beyond that. It's about saving the country. And that's what is important. And if a company has shareholders that always don't get, in, they get into conflicts and nothing, no resolutions are taken, that drives a company to go bankrupt. So it's the same, all these things are, are applicable to uh, a government. These are a few graphs just to show you, this is the, basically the balance sheet, the debt, the debt level. These are entitlement programs. This goes deeper into um, showing you that the different programs and when they go bankrupt. I'm sorry to start your morning in a negative note, but I mean, this is a little bit of reality that leads us to more important questions after. So if you look at um, the expected solvency until the year 2038 for Social Security, you have um, the expected solvency in 2018 for disability insurance, in hospitalization 2024. Now, how can we be of aid? If the US is, is bleeding, how can we go and aid and help other countries? And that's what we should be doing today, is helping you know, the poor countries and helping the United Nations achieve their, their millennium goal, which we'll speak about. And this is the aging population. You'll have 35% by the year 2035 of the population will be over uh, 65. Unemployment rate from 2001 to 2011, and this is really not the real curve. The real curve is this one. And I don't even think that that's a real graph because a lot of people are completely, completely discouraged and, and they're just not showing up anywhere on the charts. So you got here, unemployed, underemployed, and discouraged workers, plus, 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 and you're already close to 16, 17%.
Now, to be unemployed is, a, is, is very difficult. I don't know what it is because I've never been unemployed, but I could just maybe imagine it. That means that a father or mother comes in their family and they stay at home. They might start drinking. They might be aggressive with their children. They lose confidence. And that's what it's about. That's the serious part. Because that means that if you have two, three children, your parents are very depressed, or one of them is very depressed, and, and it just has negative consequences on the whole family unit. So it affects two to three children. And then that carries on for generations. And then what does that create? It creates social instability, violence. What we saw in London is just the beginning. So we need to really solve the big issues and the economic issues and really live or try to live within our means and not have too many assumptions that are too aggressive and really disappoint disappoint the communities, the families, the corporation, and all the citizens of a country. This, um, these are new graphs that came out. There's 45 million people in poverty in the United States. It is the highest level since 1993. Solutions. We have to look at if the income tax is the highest place of revenues, like I showed you before, what can we do to get people employed? A number that's very, very important is to know that 65% of job growth in this country are done through small businesses. If you are a small business today and you go to the bank, and you ask for a loan, you don't get one. So therefore, how do we actually stimulate small businesses? And I don't hear that a lot in the media. You know, I, I hear a lot about getting people back in their jobs, which is very, very important. But basically, small businesses, they create jobs. That's where people employ. A small business that was, let's say in 2008, you had a small business, you started with uh, five people, you're going to go to maybe 30 people, 100 people, 150, 300, and then it grows. What worries me is that that backlog now is, has disappeared. So if I were to start injecting money into small businesses today, it would only have a ripple effect in three years from now. So it won't solve the problem today. So in other words, all the businesses that stopped or started in 2008 are not giving fruit now because they didn't have enough capital. So we have to follow the cash. Where is the cash? So the cash sits with individuals that are wealthy. It sits outside for the corporation, outside of the United States. with some corporation inside. And the government doesn't have any more money. And they're still giving money, very generously, but they don't have a lot of money. We saw through the, the balance sheet and the income statement that it's very tight. So let's go follow where the cash is and see how they can fill the gap for now and stimulate those, those venture capital or the small businesses and get that economy going. To give 4,000, 7,000 of break to corporations for social benefits, it's good, but it's not strong enough. So what will make a difference is the repatriation, for example, of one trillion that is sitting outside of the borders of America. Give an incentive to the corporation to bring that cash back. They can, of course, they can do a dividend if they want, but have something in a plan that will permit us, permit them to have a tax break or an incentive to invest in small businesses. That is crucial. In um, a few decades ago, the Quebec 
government had a plan called the QSSP, Quebec Stock Savings Plan. This plan was, uh, was a, a very good plan. That what they did is that when an individual would invest, let's say, $100 in a stock, they would get a tax break of 50, 75%, 90%, depending on the level of risk they would take. So you, as an individual, if you want to invest in a stock and get back some kind of incentive, if it's a small business, you might take that risk. Of course, it costs money to the government, but it costs more money to have someone unemployed. Well, on the, um, a lot of um, discussions has been made on the medical plans. Some countries it works. that You have, like in Canada, you, you get full coverage. In France, you have full coverage but you don't have the population of America. And you don't have the cost structure of America. Most of the premiums in, um, for doctors are very, very, very expensive for um, their insurance protections. So that has to be built in after in the cost structure. And that goes to the patient. So the first thing to do in terms of healthcare is get your cost together. An x-ray in Washington costs four times the money than an x-ray in Paris. So you can't build up plans that you first can't afford if you don't know where your cost structure is. So there's a few things to bring costs down. Preventive medicine, teaching, education about health. The second one is of course, having system to be able to get the cost down, the deductibles. In a company, if you put a deductible on any medical prescription or anything, you'll see a drop, a radical drop from um, having a deductible or not. So for example, if you have dental care and the employee has to pay 20% or 10% of the cost, then your claims go down 75% or 80%. That is a very important one. If you have to have people paying to have a service, just a little bit or a proportion, you can sort of have different range, your demands and your claims will go down radically. Well, the other thing that's um, an example of, of, um, of jobs and infrastructure, when I was in uh, Singapore a few years ago, I saw the government was, was doing a few things with their unemployed people. They would um, bring them in and have them work on the infrastructure, train them and work on infrastructure, or try to find jobs. And that's one of the, you know, we're, we're now in, in the crisis with unemployment at all time high. So why not have people, instead of staying at home, which is terrible for the morale, the psychology, for everything, why not bring them in and start working on infrastructure? This country needs infrastructure. My mobile phone works better in India than in New York. It's not normal. It's not normal. Something's wrong. You know, people will say, you know, a lot of employees or sometimes employees come to the office and say, well, my train broke down. <laughs> train broke down. And every day there's a train line that doesn't function. That's not normal. <laughs> that is not normal. You want to have people coming into work and not even having to worry if the train is going to be on time or not on time for mechanical problems. In terms of um, what was very interesting in our study, we, we made a correlation between the education level and the income level. So increased education gives us and makes us achieve a lower unemployment rate. So I think that the governments and universities really have to work together, hand in hand, to come up with uh, better programs and to make sure that the cost of education does not become 
so elitist. In Paris, and maybe again it's, uh, it's possible to do that when you have small population, but everything, all the good schools are for free. And actually, if you go to a private school, it means you're a bad student. The good schools go to the College of Henri IV, and they go to HEC, and, and HEC will cost you maybe a thousand a year, and your undergrad will cost you nothing. So maybe it's not possible because you have such a population in the United States, but again, to go to university and pay 40,000, 50,000 a year, burden the children with that kind of debt is not a way to start life. Because what do they have to do after? They have to take the first job that has the highest salary. And that used to be banking. So all the Harvard grads from, with their MBAs, they would go right into the system and go right into these investment bankers. The good thing about the crash, the financial crisis, if we have to highlight one good thing, is that we're finding now very smart people on the market to build the country with, with true building of services and different sectors that are in great need of advancement with innovation. Now, what is very important, and I will let uh, Richard take the stand, but what is very important is the fact that innovation, innovation is one of those very important words for every sector. My work is, um, I started and I had 400 magazine and created 60 internet sites around the world. It took me about 15 years consolidating one industry. That was sort of the Craigslist around the world, or eBay. A small eBay with 18 million items uh, for sale. But really, my growth was about 50% every year, which half of it was organic, and the other uh, was uh, acquisition base. But challenging innovation and launching products is so, so important. Then I sold that business and started uh, a new business, and now we're the leaders in the news for the arts. The, what is interesting in the arts, to talk about what I know a little bit about, is that there's a correlation between good, strong economy and creativity. The number one market in the arts and arts includes auctions, fairs, uh, antiques. It does not include uh, even tourism and uh, culture. But the arts as such is, um, is very linked to the economy. The United States is number one in the art market. Number two used to be the UK, but it's China. Why is it? that we have very few artists coming out of France in the last decades, or, Span or, Span or in Spain, or Egypt, or the different countries that used to be great empires. Correlation between the arts, innovation, and economics is stronger than we think. If the economy is good, it stimulates people to think out of the box. And that's what's very important. And this summit is about the cross-disciplinary approach. It's thinking out of the box. It is not to have a linear, linear thoughts, meaning living in the disciplines with a silo. It's a creative thinking, means integrating different disciplines to get to a solution. For example, if you're CEO of a corporation, you need the marketing. You need the legal. You need the finance. You need all these departments, human resources, to make a good decision and to have a good company on the tracks running properly. Same thing if you have to make a decision on Afghanistan. You've got to be creative and innovate. And you cannot make decisions only with politicians in a room. That is wrong because you have historians, you have the culture that you have to understand, the psychology of people when you go into Afghanistan or Iraq or any country. 
You've got to think out of the box and put the human resources in there and feel out the people, understand their culture.